So welcome to this session dedicated to an Ansible 101 workshop on demand. So I'm working with uh, my friend Fer Frédéric. Uh, Frédéric, where are you? Are you in the... Uh, are you with us? Can you hear us? Yes. Say hello to everybody. Hi, everyone. Can you hear Frederick in the room? Sort of, yes. Maybe better with the mic. Say hello again. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this session. Great. So, Frederick is working from uh, Grenoble oh. in France, where I'm <laughs> also living, but I'm the one who has been elected to be there between the two of us <laughs> uh, yeah. to make this presentation. So, I'm not sharing with you, okay? No, not anymore. Let me show you. So, I can see myself. Yeah, that's great. So, we want to give you a bit of uh, information around the Ansible tool through a workshop on demand. So, this is a tool which we have developed with my friend Frederick, uh, which gives you a certain access to a certain number of workshops available 24 by 7 all the time. You can register, run the workshop, uh, learn some new stuff around a certain number of tools. We will detail that just in, in a couple of slides. So my name is Bruno Kornack. Uh, as Frédéric, I'm working for a Hewlett Packard Enterprise based in Grenoble in France. I've been working on Linux since uh, 93, um, involved in certain number of uh, open source projects as upstream or downstream because I'm also a packager for the Magia distribution. I've done stuff around uh, governance as well and I'm doing some music when I have time to do something else and just coding. And Frédéric, uh, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. So my name is Frédéric Passeron. I've been in HP for the last 20 years or so. Uh, and unless or unlike uh, Bruno, I, I don't have that much of a background on, uh, on Linux and open source, but uh, I'm working on it, as you can see. I have a strong focus on solution. I've been working on many of the infrastructure solutions that HP has put in place over the time. And I'm currently part of the HP Dev uh, Experience team or the HP Dev uh, community uh, team within HP. I'm actually responsible for the workshops on demand, the platform that we'll be using. Uh, I do a bit of coding along with Bruno. Uh, I'm building up some kind of a hi fi streamer that are based on Volumio. Uh, so that's what I, I do when, I, when I'm not working in HP and I'm not playing volleyball. So the, the Hack Shack is a, virtual, uh, is a virtual place where all the developers can gather around and actually figure out about new things that uh, or learn new technologies. So it was introduced back in Austin in KubeCon in 2017. And the idea is really to share among a, a developer of community as much as we can and tell the world that HP can provide you with some good things apart from very good servers. Uh, we also have very good solutions and very good, I would say, uh, open source uh, project that we are dealing with. So. Give a give it a try, and uh, if you go, if you don't know the, the the website, it's hpdev.io, and that's all you need to know for me for now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, so in order to introduce to this Ansible concept, uh, we will use a certain number of uh, technology here behind the scene. Uh, one is the uh, Jupyter Notebooks technology, which is hosted, as Frederic said, in his infrastructure. Um, Everybody is familiar with uh, the Jupyter Notebooks? Who is not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks? Okay, 15 pers person among uh, the person in the room here. Um, so th the goal is to give you documentation as well as code cells in the same document, but the code cells are active. So we write what you have to pass as a command, but you can run the command and get the result. And all that is in a single document where you have both documentation, text, images, explaining you the architecture, how stuff works, but as well the command line that you would like to pass to do perform the operation. And the command line is live. You can perform it. It will run, execute the code, and give you the result. So, so it's a nice way to create uh, teaching documents, I would say, 
for for people. Um, so as a, if I can add some yeah. some comments on this, originally the the notebooks technology is actually used by many of the AI and ML engineers who are working on you know data sets and that they want to you know crush somehow. So they're building up you know some uh, within the same frame a web uh, a web page I would say within the same web page they can document the, the, the different calculation that they are doing on their data sets and along with the Python or the different code language code that they're using to actually crunch the data. And we found that we found about this uh, a few years back and we found that the program was actually great because the possibility to embed at the same time some documentation and some living cell codes is uh, code cell, sorry, is, is really convenient. I mean, we used to have, you know, a document on one side in a PDF and a pretty section on the other side, and we would copy paste over the, over the two sessions, ending up in some endless issues of uh, pasting some PDF uh, stuff in there. So this is just absolutely great. It's, uh, it's fairly easy to implement, and uh, we encourage you to, to look at it, I would say. And uh, maybe it's worth to say that we'll be open sourcing. We, we are currently open sourcing the, the workshops on demand program. To so all the automation that we build around this, uh, we'll, we'll be we'll be making it available for people to leverage it over the time. Yeah. So um, the link here is a, a live one. You can go on on the side. You can book a workshop as you want. Run it for a certain amount of time, so you have a windows of two up to four hours to be able to perform the workshop. They are available all the time, and they are stuff are allocated on demand. So once you have registered, we generate the right backend environment for you so that you can run your workshop, um, and that's the mechanism to perform all that which we are working to to open source it and split it from the content. So we will open source both some content all the uh, mechanism behind the scenes so that you can reproduce in your own environment, in your own company or structure, uh, the same type of learning experience for your, your own users. So we will focus on Ansible today. So this is an automation tool. The goal is, it's, it's said to be an, an agentless tool. In fact, that's not completely true. There is a notion of agent behind Ansible, but the agent is SSH. So this is a, a communication between the master place where you're managing all the information and all the clients, which are generally servers. That communication will be done through SSH. So the master point of control will connect through SSH to the clients and launch operations using the Python language behind the scene, generating Python scripts and executing those Python scripts on the remote target to put in conformity the target system with regards to the rules that you have described on your central point of control. So that's really the goal. Everything you do as a sysadmin manually, you can automate stuff through YAML scripts, YAML configuration files. You will configure the system. You will describe how you want the system to be configured. You will give that to Ansible and Ansible will connect to the remote system, pass all the rules that you have described and put the system in conformity to all the information you want it to, to set up. So if you are a developer, what should you care about? Because uh, this is a notion of infrastructure as code. So what you really want to do is to behave as a sysadmin in a similar way as you are behaving as a developer. So you want to be able to code your infrastructure in YAML files to describe your infrastructure and to have a tool which does deal with the complexity of deploying, testing, managing the results of all the rules that you have uh, put in place. Frédéric, any other comment? Uh, well, a single one. I mean, you said it's agent class in the sense that it's SSH, but uh, the, the way it works is fairly simple. I mean, you, da you do the SSH connection, you copy over the scripts, the Python scripts, you execute them, you get the result, and you send back the result to the main server, I would say. So the agent is really a, a timeless agent in the sense that it's temporary. When you copy over the scripts, you execute them, then you send back the result back, and then you delete, actually, the scripts from the, the target machine. So that's, uh, even though it says, as you said, agentless is not that agentless, uh, really. But uh, that's uh, and the, the importance of uh, the beauty of it is the, the the possibility of managing really large systems in a in a programmatic uh, fashion. I would say. 
so let's have a look. So maybe uh, yeah, you have a, a pointer now that uh, you can use to actually uh, reach out the, the workshop registration page. So all you need to do is copy paste or copy or type in your computer and your browser this uh, URL. You will end up in this page saying uh, Ansible 101 introduction to Ansible concepts. The video has not been recorded yet. For all our all our workshops are usually backed up with a video, and I will be registering this one by the end of the month with Bruno. I think, if I remember well, we we set up a call for this. Uh, so you click on the register button and you fill up the different fields, being the company name, the company email, your email, then your name, and the company name just with OSS uh, 2022, because uh, we'll we'll be seeing how many of you are actually registering for live and uh, that will be an interesting figures for, for, for us. So https developer.hp.com slash akshak slash workshop Oops, and the phone is ringing but I won't answer it. Workshop slash 31 and register then the, you will see a grommet which is the the small the the, the, the funny guy on the on the left which is the uh, the Gromet uh, representative, I would say, uh, and uh, you will see pop up this uh, registration window. You need to actually acknowledge the, the terms and condition, and as it is stated in the in these TNCs, you will have a given uh, four-hour window or three-hour window, depending on the workshop. But keep in mind that whenever you click the register button, the automation kicks in, and the time start ticking. Okay, the clock start ticking at the time you hit the register button. Don't think you register and leave the, the thing going on and say, oh, I'm going to do the workshop later in the day. No, whenever you register, you hit the register button, you need to have some time at the time you're doing the registration to perform the workshop. That's the, the thing because we're implementing the automation as, as, as if, I mean, uh, just on the time you're hitting the button. <coughs> Okay, so not, not, not everybody in the room has a laptop with him, so you will be able to perform that later on. Keep the QR code or keep the URL available for you, and you will be able to replay what we will do now live for you at your own pace later on without any problem. Whenever, in the hotel, wherever you want. It's a, as Bruno mentioned, it's available 24 by 7 all year long, and it's completely free. I mean, we don't ask any credit card number. Uh, yet, we'll never do. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, and so maybe you can move to the to the next slide. So whenever you hit the register button, the automation kicks in, and I would say somehow within a minute or two, uh, you should be receiving an email. Okay, the first one is a welcome email telling you welcome and thanks for your participating to the workshops on demand. Blah blah blah. It will provide you uh, necessary information because for all the the workshops we have, as I said, normally we have a replay as a backup. We have a dedicated Slack channel on which you can uh, you can go and actually ask questions if you have some issues. Okay, uh, and so on and so forth. The second email uh, that should come in very shortly after will provide you with the credentials that are necessary for you to work to connect to the Jupyter Notebook environment. So you will have the username and the password, and you will have a start workshop button that you can hit. And it, whenever you click on it, it will open up a browser uh, to our Jupyter Hub environment. And in the login page, you will have to enter the username and password that were provided to you in the email. Okay. Once you are done, uh, you will see that uh, once you log in, you will enter directly on the README file, which is the README of the workshop. Every single workshop that we create has this README, and every single workshop starts with this one. This is really the, to set the stage of the workshop. It will provide you information about the author, uh, how to handle the Jupyter Notebook. So if you're not familiar with the Jupyter Notebook interface, as we were uh, explaining earlier on, as you can see, the, the, the main frame on the, oh, well, I would say on the left hand side, you have the, the browsing panel that shows you the different notebooks file that you have, uh, the pictures that are, may be embedded in the markdown cells, and so on and so forth. On the right hand side is the rendering of the notebook. Okay, so depending on the type of cells, it will be markdown, and the markdown will be really, as we said, uh, instruction and commands. Whereas the code cells, where is actually a small cell where the code uh, is actually executed. Uh, the code cells, whenever you run a code, uh, you will see that on the left hand side of the code cells, there will be a star appearing. This means that the code is executing. Whenever you get a number, this will mean that the code has been executed and you can move on to the next cells. 
to run a cell, you can use the button play, the play button at the top, or you can ask, actually use the shift enter or control enter uh, keys. Uh, so the control enter is running the current uh, cell and the shift uh, enter is running the current cell and moving to the next one. For rich cells, I mean, for the, uh, I would say the code cells, they are actually depending on the different kernels that are installed in the environment. So depending on the workshop, you may use a simple bash kernel that will provide you with a bash environment when running your code cells. But there are many, many different kernels available in a, in a Jupyter Notebooks environment. So in our workshops, we're leveraging Python, we're leveraging Rust, uh, we have Goa and other. So there is a very large list of kernels that will be available for you, depending on what you want to achieve. In our environment, mainly we stick to Bash and some few, uh, I would say, language kernels, and that's enough for what we want to achieve, which is simple examples of automation around uh, either open source tools or APIs that are embedded in some of our solutions, I would say. Okay? So, Okay. Let me refresh and I will see whether some people have managed to actually uh, register for some workshops. So, so far... ju just as a reminder, so if you look at the main portal, you can get here and have a certain number of information around what we do in that, uh, in that community. This is the HackShack portal where you can have access to the workshops themselves and replays. You have the main registration page with all the workshops on demand available. The one which is of interest for us is the Ansible 101 one. You can click on the register button and then you will have access to uh, this implementation once log logged in on the system. So once you have the registration, you get the login, the password, and you will be able to have access to that environment. Okay, so Nine people registered. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So now let's move to to the interesting part, which is the uh, the Ansible 101 itself. So you have some instruction at the beginning, which give you also the different parts for each workshop on demand. This one has four different parts. Um, Maybe I need to refresh a bit my environment to get the Hopefully images. The screen is not flickering on your side. No. Okay, that's one thing. So no, yeah, it's see. just just on your that's side. Fine. Just for me. That's yeah. Fine. <laughs> okay, so still nine people regist uh, registered so far. Okay. Okay, so I think we will. I think we will go on with uh, with showing to you what is a workshop for the people who want to do it at the same time as us. Please uh, go on, uh, log on the system. There, are Are you able to to register? To you can't hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me, but I can't see you went on mute uh, on purpose, or do you want me to go on and, and start talking about the introduction? Yeah, okay, go on. I'm not sure. Yes, no. you go on, okay. It will be less okay. easy. So, the, uh, as we saw, I mean, the, the README is just telling you about the, the different uh, concepts around the, the notebook itself. Now, we already stated about the architecture of Ansible 101, so this is a very small di diagram uh, providing you with some uh, details about how the, 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 the thing is working. So, we have, we have an Ansible management engine, and we have some targets on the right-hand side, and we're communicating through SSH, and what we'll be executing is obviously playbooks, uh, the inventory file is, is very important, we'll see that later, because this is the place where you list all the different targets and you can regroup, that, regroup them depending on your logic, I would say. So we, we'll, see, we'll see about this. So just to, to, to state uh, the, the, the purpose about the Ansible, when I started in the IT probably 20 years ago, uh, I started with some tools like uh, Intel Lamp Desk. Uh, I went with Rambo in the 
very early days of HPNet service. Then we moved on with Alteris, I think, Rapid Deployment Pack, and so on. And these were all the different tools to, to manage and deployment and configuration of many different servers. Uh, I would say that uh, I, I was very pleased to discover Ansible a few years back when I started working with uh, all the cloud solutions like OpenStack, because this would save so many hours of work uh, having to manage like a complete OpenStack environment with, you know, a HA configuration with multiple controllers and uh, different clusters for database monitoring uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, I could set up uh, an OpenStack environment that was made about 25 servers in less than two hours, leveraging Ansible playbooks, and that was just wonderful. So this is why this, uh, this uh, uh, engine is so cool, I would say. So as we uh, as we were saying, I mean, Ansible comes with uh, different sets of, uh, I would say, tools or uh, concepts. The modules are the very first one we need to talk about. So they're, they're fairly simple. I mean, these are the, the heart of uh, Ansible in the sense that uh, they, they will provide you with a set of tooling that you can actually use against your target. So maybe it would be worth clicking on the Ansible module link to give the people the chance to see the list of all the different modules that are available. And they're very, very, very numerous. And you will see uh, there are tons of them, depending on what you want to achieve from a single server type of thing, POSIX system. It could be uh, AWS, Azure, uh, I would say in industry leader, uh, related like HP or Dell or whatever, there are plenty of them. I mean, you can achieve so many, many things with that modules. That's one of the greatness of, uh, of Ansible because you don't have to start from scratch. Keep in mind that already many people who have worked on Ansible before you and whatever, what depending on the type of idea of configuration you may want to achieve, take a look at the list and you'll probably find what you need rather than rewriting uh, something that is already existing, I would say. So as you can see uh, from Docker and EC2 uh, in AWS and so on, Kubernetes, there are just tons of them. Okay, I, I, in the if you go back to the yeah, to the workshop, uh, I provided with a simple uh, examples of uh, what HP is providing uh, when it comes to infrastructure related, I would say uh, modules. So there are obviously predefined stuff for Electra, Primera, three bar, Simplivity. Uh, there are all other stuff uh, that you can use for other, I would say, HP related uh, solutions. Collections is a different thing. So a module is just a script that you, you can execute on the, on the target. A collection is just a distribution format. It allows you to actually gather uh, different things that are, I would say, Ansible related from a playbook, a role, modules, plugins, everything that you can, that are related to one single subject and that you want to package in a single uh, format, I would say. So as a, for an example in there, you have a one view collection. So this will provide you with all the necessary tooling uh, that HP can provide for uh, our infrastructure related management software, which is one view. So there you can see that uh, we have uh, all the different sets of plugin and <laughs> It keeps on adding. Uh, last time we, we ran the workshop, we were on version 6.6, .6, I think, when we did the thing back in March, I think. Uh, 7.20 now. Uh, they're, they're going way, way too far fast for me, I think. So the, the collection is fairly simple to install. As you can see, you have a, a, a command line that says Ansible collection, blah, 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 the name of the collection. And it will actually set up the collection for you in your environment. The utilities. Uh, <coughs> Well, uh, I mean, there will be, there is some code sharing in Ansible in the same in in a certain sense, meaning that uh, there are multiple modules that may use the very same code. So Ansible store the functions and and the store they are being stored as module utilities to minimize the duplication. So if they are being used by multiple type of modules, then uh, they they are being shared. Uh, you can write your own. Uh, they are only available in Python and PowerShell plugins. We won't really. Uh, make use of them today. Uh, they are here to augment the Ansible core functionalities. So the modules are executing on the target in uh, many different separated processes. Uh, plugins uh, are executed uh, widely, I would say, as a, as a process. They offer more uh, advanced uh, functionalities for or features for, uh, for Ansible. The inventory, as we said earlier on, is the one of keystone of uh, Ansible because uh, obviously it needs uh, Ansible needs to know about the different targets that it will reach out and obviously uh, work with.
use. And so the, the default uh, format for uh, the inventory is uh, INI or any file uh, in which you can group or regroup the different uh, machines that we want to use. So in this example, we can see a simple you know, web server or da uh, database server. But keep in mind that uh, <coughs> there could be, I mean, if you were to talk about OpenStack, for instance, you will see that there would be uh, yeah, a monitoring server, uh, control uh, cluster, uh, uh, ELK cluster. You can group. The list would be very, very, very long. You, you can also group them using other type of approach. Yeah, it could be geographically, for example. It could be based on you know the, the the type of machine they are. They could be based on the location. So it's really up to you to decide what kind of logic you want to use uh, in this in, in this inventory file. The roles actually are, I would say, uh, uh, a super. Uh, oh, the, the ultimate goal you should want to look for when dealing with Ansible. So w in the workshop, you'll see that we'll be starting very low, at the very lowest level, which is running a command through an Ansible scale then using a module, then probably we'll be creating a task which will represent the module that we've been using, but this will be integrated in a playbook, okay? And this playbook can have multiple tasks, okay? On top of the playbook, you can actually create a role that will be a set of playbooks, okay? That will be targeted on different type of machines, okay? And the roles, as you can see, can be divided in many, many different categories. So for instance, it will start by a common category, and this is the basic of every single connect or every single, single configuration that you want to achieve on every single machine that you are dealing with in your Ansible environment. So common is just operating system related, uh, LDAP configuration, it could be uh, the type of security you want to implement, uh, uh, the latest updates and packages that you want to be common on every single node that you want to deploy, okay? And on top of this, you are adding some layers, of it, okay? And they can be cross, I mean, every, everybody will be common. Then you will have a web server that will have dedicated tasks to install Apache, configure Apache. Uh, there might be some dedicated tasks to implement HA proxy and this type of things. And then you will move on to maybe another group that will be DB server, but the DB server might, might have some tasks that are common with another group of servers because they are both uh, HA uh, uh, related, for instance, and so on and so forth. Within each group, you can see that there are tasks, default, there are files, templates, variables. So for each of them, you can actually leverage some other, I would say, tools uh, or uh, uh, functions that are available in Ansible. So task is just the, the task you will be executing in a series. And those are kind of reactions. So something you want to react on a given task, uh, if something goes wrong or not, maybe, uh, this is something you can actually uh, use. Uh, the libraries that you want to use, the default is uh, things that you want to, the, the default variables you'll be using, some dedicated variables for each of the group, and so on and so forth. You can use also some templates, and uh, we'll see that later maybe in, in, a, in a moment. The playbook, as I said, is, uh, is a way to orchestrate and uh, add some additional or a series of tasks within a single uh, file, okay? But providing the, a way for you to build up the layers that you want to implement on a given system or on multiple systems. Okay, so you can use uh, simple, uh, I would say, operating system commands as a, as a, in a playbook. You can use the modules as well. And uh, you will have to define, obviously, on which target you want to run the playbook. Uh, in the example that we have, you can see that the target will be web servers. There will be a serial uh, series in the sense that uh, how many servers do that do I need to work on at one at one point of time? Which are the roles that I want to apply on? So obviously the common one, which is the operating system, as I said earlier on, plus the web layer, the, the web application layer. Sorry, and so on and so forth. So the playbook will provide you this uh, this structure to actually uh, it's a it's a simple script, but it's defined in a YAML format. I would say the variables. Uh, Obviously, all the systems are not equal, and you need to define them and differentiate them somehow. Uh, if you want to run a very same command on multiple servers, uh, well, take a simple example as an IP or a name or 
uh, any other uh, username and this kind of thing. So these are variables that you can use and leverage uh, to be passed at one point of time in your YAML file. In the example here, you can see that uh, the, the host, the app application server, has different uh, variables for the application pass. The base pass is between brackets, meaning that this is coming from a Jinja template and that at the time of the deployment, uh, the variable will be substituted by the by uh, Ansible with the variable that has been defined as the base pass. So it will provide the, the regular uh, thing. Uh, I will leave it to you for explaining the templates and Jinja too. Bruno, if you don't mind. Yes, thank you. And, uh, you don't hear me. I'll be in a minute. Okay. okay, so let's go back to, to, to the templates. Um, the notion of variable here is interesting when you want to do overlay, for example. Uh, you may have different type of environments, a production environment, a development environment, a test environment. They may all have the same way of being addressed, but having a different URL, different path, a different whatever. Uh, and the variables is one way to globalize a notion and instantiate a differentiation between the different type of systems that you have. And as uh, Frederick was mentioning, this is using the Jinja2 uh, templating system, which is part of the Python language. It is a, a feature of the Python language in addition to the Python language. And this is a very powerful um, templating system which allows you to do this type of variable substitution, but also to perform some control structure on top of uh, what you do in the normal YAML files that you do. For example, you can make loops on a certain number of systems. You can take, make tests. You can say, if that system is a test system, if it's a prod system, I do that type of generation of code or that type of generation of code. So you have a lot of possibilities through Jinja2 to create dynamicity into your environment and the description of the infrastructure uh, that you want to create. Um, so you have the bracket percent, which is uh, the beginning and, and end of control statements for loops and if else then if else uh, statements. You have the double brackets, so for uh, variables typically, and uh, you have also the bracket hash, which is uh, used for commenting your your templates in your environment. And we will see during the execution of the um, of the Ansible playbook how we can use and leverage those templating system to address differently uh, two target systems in the environment. I will not detail too much the search path. You need to know that there is a search path in Ansible that you can modify and adapt the way you want. Okay, let's go to lab two and start to run some stuff. So, as we said before, running some stuff, we need to know which system we want to target, which system we want to configure and manage. And here we will have two systems. We have a local system, so machine which runs my Jupyter environment, and another target system, different, empty, uh, on which I want to pass and control some configuration items. So typically, what I want to, to start with, I want to start with anything, no, no inventory, nothing. I will just start with some common lines examples to give you an idea of how it's working and how also the Jupyter interface is working for those of you who don't know that. Let me put it here. Okay, so typically if I press shift enter on that first line, I execute what is documented here. So I ask to Ansible to look at the local, local host machine. Sorry. No, no, I can set, maybe. Is it big enough now? Okay, should be better like that. So what is ask in this command line to do to Ansible is Ansible, the main Ansible command which is not the one we will use later on, but that's the main command. We want it to act on the localhost machine, which is a local system. Everybody is comfortable with the notion of localhost? Okay. And we call one specific module 
of Ansible, which is a ping module, which is like the ping command on the command line interface. So you send an ICMP request to the machine and you get an ICMP reply from the machine if everything works fine. Um, and here we have the trace that Ansible generally gives to you. This is a success operation. It has not changed since the last time. And to the ping command we launched, we got a pong response from the exactly. local host system. So this is just a simple one-liner to show the basic mechanism of how Ansible is working. Uh, we can change, of course, modules. We have other type of modules like the uptime command. I type shift enter. And so this is again executed live and I see the answer that Ansible provides to me, which gives me the uptime of that system, which has been up for a certain number of hours and days now. Okay, so that gives you an idea of what can be, and, and we use those tools as debug mechanism uh, when we are set up, especially the communication with the remote system to be sure that we can communicate correctly with the target and don't have any problem at that level. That's one way to, to help uh, with the setup. Now, let's try to do something more interesting. So, writing our first playbook in YAML. So, what the block here does, it's, so this is shell, it's asking to the cat command to create that test.yaml file up to the word end of file, which is here. So everything here will be put in the file called test.yaml and we will print at the end the test.yaml. So if I press shift enter, it says to me that the file has been created and it contains that content. So this is YAML, so you have uh, different type of information and, and a specific format to respect and a number of spaces to respect. This is pretty strict with regard to the format you, that you need to, to use, but it's uh, pretty easy to read and to understand also during time. So it's, it's not like a programming language where you need to understand the logic behind. It's just a set of instructions and giving you uh, a declarative way of performing operation on the system. So here I say, okay, I want to work on the host, local host. I just have one, still one for the moment. I want, I don't want to gather the facts on that system. Ansible gives you the possibility to query the system before launching anything. And putting in environment variables, a large set of information that it gets from the system, IP addresses, MAC addresses, uh, distribution number, set of packages, etc. It gathers a lot of information and creates variables so that you can use those variables yourself in your playbook to perform different type of actions depending on the value of those variables. So here we don't want to use that yet. We will do later on. And we have just one task. So this is a playbook which is completely equivalent to the previous command line with Ansible. We just use module ping, which is here, the name of the ping module. And there is no parameter because the ping module does not take any parameter. And we need to give a list of tasks. So we just have one task here. The task has a name which is called ping. And it does call the module to perform the ping. So exactly the same as the previous one. But this time I use the Ansible playbook command and I pass to that command the name of the playbook I have written under the YAML format just Bruno, a couple of seconds before. Hopefully yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, just uh, I wanted to mention that it would be relevant to explain to the people the minus VVV just to show the verbosity of Ansible and how actually the uh, the um, well, the overall process of, uh, of uh, you know, copying the modules over and executing them through SSH or locally when you run them uh, on the locals. Okay. Okay, so uh, if you want to, to debug that Ansible playbook uh, operation, you, you can, and this is also interesting to see that the Jupyter Notebook uh, environment that you have here is able to be modified on the fly. So I'm for now, I have just run uh, existing commands, but I can change the command. I can say, okay, I want to have more debug on that command. If, if I know the command and I know how to pass some information to it, 
I can change it dynamically and now I have a bit more information on what does the Ansible playbook here with regards to uh, the context of execution which is at the start and then the name of the playbook and the ping module itself becomes more verbose uh, and gives me a bit more information and I can increase the verbosity of my command by adding more V to it. Uh, be aware that if you have passwords, for example, that are masked uh, by normal operations, they may then, through that level of verbosity, appear in clear text uh, under the, the trace that you are generating at that level. So here you see all the uh, <laughs> gory details of what happens behind the scenes. So Ansible is creating uh, a certain number of uh, elements uh, that you can see here. It creates a temporary directory, it creates uh, a Python set of uh, scripts, includes some uh, Python modules that it needs, generate all that, launch it to the machine and execute it. Here as we are local hosts, there is no SSH connection yet. We will see the SSH connection later on when we deal with a remote system. For the local system, it's just executed, as we see here, locally using a shell command. So we can have all the level of details if we want to help debugging an issue that we are uh, encountering here. Okay, so that was to give you an idea of how we, we started with it. Now we want to address more than one system and we want to have another target. So we create an inventory file which describe a group which is called target and that group has just one IP address which is the target system that we have in our environment. We create a new playbook and that new playbook is using that group target so here we have just one machine behind but it could be 10 systems behind the same way and Ansible will iterate on the 10 systems to perform the same operations on the 10 systems. We still don't, don't ask to gather facts and again we just do a ping on that system. So we create the playbook and we execute the playbook. No host matched. Okay. Did I miss one? Uh, I missed the inventory, of course. No. So I need to first run the inventory. Now this one is created and this one will have the inventory created and will be able to contact my remote system and say, okay, I can ping the remote system, which is nice because I want to do more stuff with that remote system. Okay. Um, okay. Just to show that now with SSH, you will see that there are much more than, uh, okay. than what it is to do with uh, the local play. There you go. Yeah. So we will see indeed that there is no shell executed here, but that we have uh, an OpenSSH communication uh, reading the configuration of OpenSSH and the SSH execution of the SSH command to run on the remote host the ping uh, operation, the ping command which is run as a Python script and get the result. So you, you see all the verbosity that you can get in the dialogue and you see that the dialogue is pretty uh, intense between the control system and the remote machine. Okay, uh, I would like to jump uh, this one, uh, Frédéric, because I don't think it's so useful here. I would like so this is a configuration file. You can modify the way Ansible behaves by changing some parameters in the configuration file. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure it's something so useful here. Um, so let's now create a task. Uh, which is play. Okay, so this is a new play. The play again targets the same target system that doesn't gather facts and again is pinging the remote system. Now we will modify the inventory, so it's working exactly as previously. We will just modify the inventory and we will add a second system to our inventory. So now we have two targets 
in our target group and when we execute again the playbook and that's where Ansible really makes sense is when you have multiple systems that you want to play with. So the same playbook, the same ping operation is passed on the first system which is a local system and on the remote system as well below. And you have for each execution a status which is return and you have a summary at the end which gives you what has changed, what is if the system is reachable or not, if there is a failure, if the system was skipped because of a condition or stuff like that. So here we have two systems, you can have 20 systems, you can have 100 system, systems, it works exactly the same way. So now that we have seen the basic commands and how it was working, let's go into more features of how Ansible is working. First we will use the notion of variables that we have seen before during the presentation and we will define some variables. So we will create a vars directory which will appear here on the left hand side in my, uh, in my environment under my subdirectory for the workshop Ansible. And I will say, okay, my student name. So I will say, I'm Bruno, I'm student ID 75, and I am in Dublin. And I will let, so this is, this all the variables that will be affected to a specific file, variables which are local to my system. And I have variables which are dedicated to my target remote system and I will be able to use different variables. So the variables have the same names, of course, between the two files, but they point to different values depending whether I'm using a local system or a, a remote system. Don't forget to execute it. Okay, so the variables files are now created. And now we'll create a playbook which will make benefit of those variables. So the playbook targets the host first, the host local host. We will include the variable locals and we will create a text file. And that text file, which is here, we will use inside the text file. So this is a block. We, we, we want to create it. We will put it here at that location and the content will be mention that as you can see the path is student 75 and it's not student 75 the name of the workshop so the, the file won't be appearing in the in the left hand uh, I mean on the yeah the just upper on the left hand side unless the persons are going one way up one directory up to see it exactly yeah because we are one directory down so in that block what I do is I create a text file in which I use Ansible variables the one I have described just before. So the student name, the student ID, and the location. Whoops. Excuse me. And the node on which this is run. So this file, which is created here, I can execute my cell. So I created my playbook. Now that my playbook is created, I can ask to Ansible, please execute with the inventory. And so now I have run my playbook. And if I go, so this is just on the local host. And I have made the adaptation for that file. It has changed. There is one file which has changed. If I go so upper here, I see that my file is here. And if I go in the file, I see that the file has, was generated uh, for Bruno, which is my, my first name, ID 75, running, and this is the name that Ansible gets from the uh, gathering of facts on my system. So m the machine on which I am running, the local host, in fact has a full name, which is this one. So I have replaced my Ansible variables by some values, some values that I can pass in a variable files, and I can have multiple variables files as we will see, some values which are queried by Ansible on the local system gathered as facts, 
and reused by Ansible itself. Okay, so the same thing here. You can see it directly in the notebook. Okay, so now that we have seen how we can use variables, there is something we can do with Jinja2, which is the possibility to make a test and use one or the other of the two variables depending on the value of some environment items. So here I will again use um, the variables which have been declared previously. I will create a new file in lab 3.2. The source is in the templates. So I will create first, I will generate that playbook and I will have a look at that template, at that file in the template, which looks similar to the previous one. Oops. Okay. So I have again my variables here and the fact which has been gathered at that level. So if I execute it, I won't see much differences with the previous one, except that now my inventory is taken in account. So I run the playbook on two systems, not just one system. And I can see that as I have touch the two systems, I have generated two files, one which is local, another one which is remote, and I can have print the value of the two files. And of course, I see that the first name is the same because it was a static variable file that was used in the playbook. If I go back to the playbook, I just included the local variables, which contains the Bruno first name and the Dublin location. But as uh, the third variables used was something which is gathered as a fact, it was created by Ansible on the system directly. So on the first system, I point to my Jupyter Hub system, but on the second system, the remote one, I have another value here which correspond to the real name of the remote machine. So now let's go a bit further. So instead of each time looking at the results separately, having to launch a shell uh, to monitor the results, I can integrate in my playbook the monitoring of the files which are generated. So here is a new playbook targeting the same systems. I still gather the facts this time, and I want on each system to cat the resulting file which has been created by my Ansible playbook environment. And I want to look, and I have a new concept here, I register the result of the command which is here. So I want to execute the command get the result, and the result, I want to print it. So I use the std lines here, which is a, an attribute of my result. And as part of the debug module, I want to print the content of those files. So I create my new playbook, and I can execute that playbook again on my inventory, so on my two systems. And I can see in the debug part that I can print with the message variable. I can print the two content of the two files which have been generated on the remote systems. So now what I would like is having a bit more dynamicity in my generation, in my execution of Ansible. I would like to be able to say if I'm working locally, I do something. If I'm working remotely, I do something else. So here in this playbook, I have new tasks 
which are using the when keyword of Ansible. That when keyword allows me to, when I gather facts, to get that variable, which is gathered by Ansible, which is the host name um, of, the, uh, of the system. And depending whether the uh, IP address is loop back or not local localhost or not localhost, I don't include the same variables. And I continue to generate the same files, and that file is using variables which, have, which are declared in those variables files, but are not the same depending whether I, I'm working locally or remotely. And I think there is something interesting to look at here. So let's look at the template. Uh, and we also change the template here. So the templating file, 3.3, at that level, is a bit different because we use some Jinja2 features. So we say, OK, I'm printing the variables as before, same variables, nothing changed. I just added the location to be a bit more exhaustive. And now I'm using a condition in Jinja2. I can say, OK, if in my inventory I am working on localhost, then I will add to my text file this sentence, I'm running locally. If not, I will write, I'm running remotely. So now, if I use always my Ansible playbook, this new playbook with this new template with the same inventory, let's look at what is done here. So again, this is run on the systems. And this, this is run twice here. We see that for each system, in our playbook, we make a decision. And we skip the, 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 the include vars, which is, um, so we skip the remote when we want to include the local variables. And we skip the local when we want to include the remote variables. So it's a possibility here with, with the when keyword to say, when the condition is satisfied, I do this type of inclusion or this type of inclusion. That way, I have two set of variables which are different depending on the system, whether it's local or whether it's remote. And then, after this inclusion, I template my file, and I template it on the two systems at the same time, but using different set of variables. And now I'm generating the new text file, and I want to look at the new text file content. So I'm using the same Ansible playbook to look at the results. OK, let's create it. Let's run it. OK, so the first one, which is on the remote system, says that it has been generated for Apollo ID 11 running on the other system, the remote one, placed in the moon. And the second one, which is local, is for Bruno. ID 75, the right name of the Jupyter Hub, and placed in Dublin. So with a single template, by injecting different type of variables through the when keyword in the Ansible uh, playbook, I am able to generate completely different files. And again, I, am, I have also, I am running remotely, I am running locally, which this time is generated through a test case in the template itself. So you have a lot of ways to uh, dedicate some actions based on some variables, some content, and perform different type of setup the way you want it. You're just limited by your, your creativity here, and you have possibilities through templating and through orders inside the playbooks to modify completely what you are generating. Uh, typical example, I a concrete example I have on that is uh, when you are, for example, managing SMTP servers in an infrastructure and you have internal relays, external relays, you have different, and, and you are using the same tools, say PostFix, for example, or SunMail, 
the sendmail.cf file or the main.cf file for postfix uh, can be completely generated using uh, the overall same template, but different type of uh, values because when you're internal in your environment, the relay is not the same as the relay that you use externally, for example. Uh, repeat that, please. I said there are 19 people registered, and okay. hopefully they're all having a, a good session. They don't face any issue with the registration or anything. According to the database, they all received uh, their credentials, so it should be fine. Okay. Hopefully. So, one typical use case and something we have uh, been faced with during the setup of this environment. So this environment that you are seeing here, the deployment of all the workshop on demands rely on a lot of Ansible playbooks behind the scene. And one use case uh, that we have is we want to set up our different appliances uh, using a single playbook, but as we don't run the same software in the same place. Sometimes we need an Ubuntu distribution, sometimes we need a CentOS distribution. And we want to be able to perform the right action on the right system based on the distribution. And the distribution is something that Ansible gathers as a fact during the gather fact operation. So here typically you have a new play which gather facts and the first tasks say get curl package version and typically, what we do is we do rpm minus q curl when we are on CentOS distribution and we register the result. Or we do dpkg minus s curl by grep version when we are on an Ubuntu system to have the same information. And after that, we print the version for CentOS or for Ubuntu. And as we registered in two different variables, we print with two different orders. So again, we can create that, that new playbook. So you see all, all on the left-hand side, all the playbook we are running are created here. And you have them at the end of the execution if you want to copy them, replay them, modify them the way you want. So if we execute again that playbook on the two systems, and here we have two different systems, we see that the remote system is a CentOS system, which has curl 729, and the local host system is an Ubuntu machine running curl 768. So based on the, on the notion of local variables through the gathering of facts, we can get, get this information and we can take actions based on that. Typically, you can say that curl version is not recent enough. I missed that option in that version, so I need to upgrade it, etc., etc. That's there are a lot of stuff that you can perform later on based on that. Uh, let's see another concept in the playbooks, which is a notion of loop. Um, and for that, we will use an external API call possibility uh, provided by the Gutenberg project. Uh, we will create a new playbook. We will query books on that site and we want to create multiple books. We want to make a loop to go from number 20 to number 25. And if you're running the, the workshop at the same time as me, you can modify uh, those variables uh, make uh, 15 and 20, for example. Don't put too much to not put too much uh, pressure on, on that site, but you can perform that very easily. And what we want to get, uh, so there is a bit of uh, GQ magic behind the, the curl command to analyze the JSON format which we are receiving from that website and to get all the entries and all the cover uh, images of those books that we want to register and then we will download those cover books to store them in our environment. We have the, the pictures uh, directory ready for that. So we use new concept in uh, the Ansible playbook environment. We will do a loop 
and the loop will be defined by a range and the range will be here in our case from book minimum value which is 20 up to book maximum value which is 25 but you can do uh, with whatever value you want in your loop here you can loop also on items you can loop on other type of elements and ansible variables the way you want okay let's compute create set playbook and now run it so this is run just locally and now we see that we have a loop which has been done for all our items from 20 to 24 like in Python you you give the maximum value and the value which is the last one used is the maximum minus one and we see that we get we make some queries on the Gutenberg site to download the cover images of all the books from 20 to 25 and if I remember correctly we have here so some seconds ago we have downloaded some images of some books which are hosted by the Gutenberg project okay so I said when when you have for example a verbose mode you see some password appearing and sometimes you have operations where you you need to perform uh, with some secrets and and not printing them and not putting them in configuration files uh, so that they are seen easily uh, in your environment so ansible provides to you the notion of vault uh, which allows you to store encrypted values of secrets that so nobody can read and those values are then used on the fly during Ansible playbook execution so that you can typically uh, encrypt a certain number of values or you can use some passwords to have access to some services without providing the password value to uh, other people so we have on the system a website which is available here the website is running on a specific port and so when we go on that port we see that we have an Apache server which is running here waiting for us to do something clever with it so what do we want to do is using a private zone on the web server so we can see that we have a private page here so which is and and Frederick I wonder whether we are not missing here the uh, the port of the maybe not so we have a private page hosted on the web server for each student each time we create a student we create a private zone and that private zone allows the user to have access to private information which are only available if we use the password associated to the user so here as an example we show with curl how to use the private zone giving on the command line the username and the password of that user which is just an illustration but not something you want to do in a real environment of course let's execute that environment so if we look at the uh, student 75 zone by default it's not found because we don't give any authentication to it so the first command Let me check something. Yeah. Check 
fist. Yeah, I think I missed the, the port number, which should be generated automatically, uh, which is here, 16051. So each user has a port, if I do. 1651. But I think it should be. Because the port is mandatory if we want to use it. Let's try a no to host. Hmm. No, that was not a good idea. Okay. Sorry for that, we'll have to look at it because I don't think it's correct here. So the idea, the idea if you have a password that you want to use is to create a vault to store the password. So there is an Ansible vault command which can encrypt a string such as the password that you have. So you can pass that on the command line. You keep a, a vault secret associated to, to it and you create a variable which will be created. So if I do that here, you will see it in the environment normally. So you create one variable which is associated to the notion of vault and which is completely encrypted through the salt passed uh, in, on the command line. So that variable, you can use it, the web login information, which, is co which contains a password. You can have it on your file system. You can use it through Ansible commands, but nobody else but you knowing uh, the secret pass that crypts uh, the vault will be able to have access to that information. And then you can use those information through Ansible uh, variables mechanism to connect remotely to a system or to use a mechanism which needs a password to be able to perform it. And the way you do it, even if I'm not able here to, to show it to you, uh, it's to include the variable files that you have generated and then, for example, you can use the URI module of Ansible to say, I want to connect to that URI and the user and the password. The password here is web login, but nobody is seeing web login. Even when you do the verbose activity on the command line, you will see a set of bytes which are passed by Ansible, but decrypted on the fly through the secret which is stored in the vault. So the vault is a, varf, is, is a YAML file itself. So uh, each user can have its own vault environment and use, include, see, see if for example, if you name the same, the var.yaml file, you may, you may have a single uh, playbook file, which includes that var file as here. You do it here, I lost my mouse. This command can be completely common to all the users. But the value of what is inside the var.yml file can be specific to each user. So that's something you can share and with an implementation which provides to you different values on the fly based on what the user has encrypted as, as a content in the vault. So sorry, I'm not able to show it. There is something which is not completely working correctly here. But I can move to, to the last lab, which is the notion of role. 
because that's that's really uh, the ultimate goal of what, what you try to achieve with, with Ansible is you want to say, um, I want to create a web server role, a mail server role, a security server role, whatever, by accumulating a certain number of tasks, some of them being common between all the roles, some of them being, being specific, and you want to reproduce each time. The, the, the beauty of, of it is that the reproducibility of the execution. Each time you relaunch the command, Ansible replay what needs to be replayed. It does not regenerate something which, which, when the generation is already correct. So you, you converge to a final situation, which is the one you describe in your YAML file. And you converge by applying a certain number of tasks grouped into playbooks, themselves grouped into a role to perform the nature of the server you want to configure and manage at the end. So here we have, in fact, I don't, I don't want to repass here uh, everything which has been done uh, in the introduction, but uh, here we have created small playbooks each at a time, and we can gather them now to create the notion of role for our lab. So I will first create a structure on the disk to store that information. I will copy, so the role will take advantage of everything we have done before. So we need the templates. And I will copy the existing templates we generated under the role directory. So here, I have my templates. I will also create the tasks that I want, and I will copy the last, one of the last playbook as my main task for this role. So what is possible with, with that is you create elementary playbooks, elementary configuration items, and at the end, you can group them to create and perform your role. So now it said edit the main .yaml file to remove the three first line. Why? It's because in a role, the notion of target system is part of the inventory and it's not part of uh, the, the content of the role itself. So if I look at my file here, I don't need this anymore because I already know that what I have as the YAML content below is the set of tasks I want to perform on my system. So I can remove this and I need to adapt my YAML content so it's correct YAML. So that's the party which is not the most fun. So each time you, you have an indentation, so you have the, the, the dash at the start to introduce the keyword which performs the block, and then you have the same word which needs to be aligned with the first block uh, keyword. So here, for example, the name and the template is the name of the module. Name is just, in fact, a comment. And the template module takes three parameters, and those three parameters are indented of two space each time, and each has its own value. Okay, so I can save this one. I can do the same with my handlers. So the operation of tests that I've performed in a playbook, I say, okay, this is interesting. I want each time a playbook is run, I want to also run the test operation at the same time so that it's performed as part of my role. And same story, I need also to edit in the handler. Bruno, tu n'as pas fait le clean-up avant de faire ton lab. Je ne sais plus si c'était important les temps. Uh, when I ask people to actually do the simple exercise, I don't know whether you did it or not. Is it relevant or not? Mm. Yeah, so you created the roles and everything already. Mm. 
I didn't do any any specific cleanup, but I, I didn't run the the role be previously, so it should be it should be clean normally. Okay, so I have my handlers. So, for example, a, a typical use case of handlers, uh, you you configure a web server, your HTTP server, and at the end of the new configuration, if you change the configuration, you redeliver a new configuration file. At the end, you need to say to the HTTP server, rerun, reload the configuration file to get the new configuration and put it in operation. So a handler will do that. A handler will be the operation you need to pass to say to the web server, reload your configuration file and apply it. Kill minus one typically of a daemon. That's generally what you have as handlers when you need to say to the daemon, re re reload your configuration file and reapply it. Same stuff with my variables, which are now here as well. So here we see the content of the lab role. We have some directories under which we have some YAML files. And this role is something that you can build once on the system and you can propagate it to other people. If you have colleagues elsewhere running Ansible and wanting to apply the same role as you, that's a separated unit that you can pass to other people. And of course, you put that under Git and you manage it in a central place and, and uh, everybody is, is using the same content. But that's something which is completely isolated and that you can pass to other people to run and they will get the same result as you using the same uh, inventory file, of course. And now I need to create the last YAML file. So I have my handlers, I have my tasks, I have my templates. I now also need to have a, a, a header of all those uh, files, which is the main role YAML file, which will tell on which target I want to apply that, and which has a new keyword, which is roles, and which describes the directory in which I will find all the operations that that role needs to perform. And now when I'm at that point, I can run the Ansible playbook on the role. And I made a mistake in my, uh, in my modifications uh, in the handlers. In the handlers. Uh, there is something missing here, yes. Debug MSG here, here. Okay. So YAML can be a bit tricky to to deal with when you when you start. And so here I have the possibility with my my single role if I go again up. Uh, so the role is executing all the tasks in order, including the creation, so including the, the variables as we have seen before, creating the template file and launching the verification at the end of the template when there is something changed. So here there, is, there has been no change in my content, no files has been changed, so Ansible said the job was already done correctly, so I don't need to run the handler. I don't need to make any modification. I don't need to check the modifications. If I do a modification somewhere, typically in the templates, and I say, okay, um, which one is used here? Is it, oh, let me check in the tasks. This is a 3.3 for the template. So if I modify the template now, and I say uh, locally here, don't really care about the nature of the modification. And you go back here and you say, I want to rerun again that playbook. This time Ansible will check that something has changed. So I've changed one of the two parts of the template. One generated file has changed. And in that case, we see that it's a local host which had been changed and the check has been performed on top of, of this modification 
which is not displayed, but which is run by, by Ansible as a check. Is going to conclusion, Bruno? Yes. So let me go back to, whoops. Do you want to, to take it, Frederic? And please mention how important the survey is. <laughs> Thanks. Exactly. Okay, so we have performed here a certain number of basic operations with Ansible. Um, what is interesting as well, as you have seen, there are a lot of modules. I don't know if you're done, Bruno. Just tell me when you're done and I'll be saying just a very quick uh, final words. Okay, so... Before questions, I'm pretty sure we have some in the room. Uh, at that point, you have seen a certain number of basic operations that you can do with Ansible. There are a lot of mo existing modules. We have just show to use uh, three, four, five modules that are mandatory, I would say, to make a tour of what Ansible provides to you. Um, you can interact with a lot of hardware and software pre-packaged, provided by the project upstream. You just need to download sometimes the right collection in addition to the roles that you already have as part of the Ansible distribution. So you have a certain number of roles part of the distribution and you have a certain number of collections which adds interaction with other type of hardware and software available. Now, it's uh, what is very interesting with that tool is that you can um, leverage on existing playbooks and you can write your own but you don't need to write everything at the first start. You, you start with small tasks that you want to perform and you want to re-perform each time and you leave the tool doing that for you. And one day you realize that there is an additional task that you want to make. So you had two lines in your playbook, then two, and two other lines, etc. So the playbook is really something that you're building as time passes and that you're growing to um, take typically some special cases that you've missed initially. So for example, uh, when you configure a system, sometimes you start from a clean state, sometimes you start from an unclean state. And the problem with idempotency, which is a so, so feature that uh, Ansible provides, is that you need to think about what state my system is and what state I want it to have as a final state. And depending on the original state, you want to analyze all the cases and converge the situation to the final state, which are the one you want. And so that may lead you to add new lines to your playbook to correct some other states that you find on the system because someone has made manual modifications, because some configuration files have been uh, modified by another tool, uh, not under the control of Ansible. So all those typical cases, you want to be able to uh, address them in your playbook. So as time passes, your playbooks will grow and be more and more uh, precise in the way you are configuring your, your target systems. And you can use a lot of modules existing on, uh, on, on in, inside the project and inside various collections and develop your own very specific way of managing the system using that type of tool. Frédéric, final words for you? <laughs> okay, thanks Bruno. So, first remark, uh, fortunately for me, I'm not epileptic, otherwise I'd be dead a uh, hundred times during this session because of the flickering of the screen. You can't imagine how it was just keeping on flickering. It was quite a, quite a pain. Anyhow, just wanted to mention that uh, yeah, the, the, the survey is very important in a, in a conclusion uh, notebook and that uh, obviously we are working on the on adding some new content. So this is a 101 session on Ansible. Uh, hopefully it will be followed by, uh, by another, uh, another session. So uh, you, probably know about, you probably know about HP GreenLake and uh, all the services that it provides you, it provides to customers. Uh, we're currently working quite closely with the, the different development teams and uh, 
one of them is actually uh, building up some uh, Ansible playbooks to be used in the in the different services like uh, VM as a service or container as a service or bare metal as a service type of uh, things. So, and uh, I'll be working closely with them to actually try to build up a, 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 an advanced session on Ansible uh, as well as uh, GreenLake. So altogether, uh, an advanced session. Uh, and really, that's uh, that was uh, what I wanted to say. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Bruno already mentioned that we are, and, and I'll be repeating it, that we are open sourcing this and that uh, we'll be very happy to share this, uh, the work that we've been uh, dealing with for the last uh, two years nearly with Bruno, building up the infrastructure, allowing these uh, workshops to exist and to be delivered. Hopefully this, the, the session was interesting for you and uh, hopefully the, the 19 people who went through the registration process did not encounter any issue in running the workshop itself. Uh, I hope to see many of you uh, in the workshop uh, database later on uh, or in the next coming days or months. Uh, uh, take a look at what we provide. I mean, some of the, the workshops are really open source related and they might be relevant to you. I mean, if you have no knowledge about Kubernetes or a given programming language like Rust, for instance, uh, this might be uh, of interest. We managed to gather the different workshops in categories. Uh, we're dealing with many, many different subjects. I mean, ranging from infrastructure as a code to AI and, uh, you know, Spark, uh, machine learning, uh, GreenLake. Uh, there's a simple API 101, so there's plenty of, uh, of Git 101. There are plenty of things to be to be looked at. Looked at, I would say. Uh, I know that uh, once we'll be will be done with uh, with the open sourcing of the stuff, uh, Bruno will go back on uh, trying to produce some pack, uh, some packaging on Linux workshop. Uh, there is a concourse 101 that is also on the on the list, and uh, and many many more to come. So. I think that's uh, really what I wanted to share with you is the fact that it's a, a, a living program and we, will, we, we are also, sorry, welcoming contribution from the external world. So obviously all this content is mainly produced by HP people, but nothing prevents you from giving us a call and uh, reaching us by email. And uh, if you are willing to you know, create some content uh, that is open source related, We'll be very, very happy to welcome you and work with you, uh, building up a new workshop that will be uh, available for the community. I mean, uh, that's the, the the purpose of the HP Dev community is to innovate and share all together within the the community. So we'll try our best to make more and more open source content available in the workshops as well as on the portal itself. And uh, we also, if you're willing to write a blog we welcome this type of initiatives as well we have a cms that allows you to go through the, the process of editing a blog very quickly so if you look for a, a place to shout out if i could say so uh well you can also contact us with that being said i think that uh, i will leave it to you we know and i think we're nearly done with the time so I'll be thanking you. Merci beaucoup from France. I wish I could have been with you uh, in the room. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the budget was not uh, that high enough to allow me to fly over, unfortunately. But next time, uh, I'll, make, I'll make my best to, to go and meet you all. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup and have a good day, hopefully. Back to you, Didier. Uh, Bruno, sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Frédéric. Uh, is there any additional question in the room? We still have two minutes left. If not, I give you two minutes of your time back and wish you a happy event. Thank you. <laughs>